Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses part one of the section of the book titled Eigenvectors and Upper Triangular Matrices. This video focuses on the existence of eigenvalues. Let's quickly review our notation and terminology. F denotes either the scalar field R of real numbers or the scalar field C of complex numbers. We let V denote a vector space over F. The word operator means a linear map from a vector space to itself. And L of V means L of V comma V. In other words, L of V is a set of operators from V to V. We now need to define the powers of an operator T. If M is a positive integer, then t to the m is defined to be t multiplied by itself m times. Recall that multiplication of operators is really just composition of linear maps. Thus t squared, which equals t times t, is equal to t compose t. t to the zero power is defined to be the identity operator i on v. And if t is invertible, with inverse t raised to the minus one power, then t to the minus m is defined to be the inverse of t raised to the nth power, as you see here. As an example of our definition, t cubed means t times t times t. Suppose t is a linear operator on v, then t to the m times t to the n is equal to t to the m plus n, and t to the m raised to the nth power is equal to t to the m times n power, where n and n are arbitrary integers if t is invertible, and non-negative integers if t is not invertible. You should be sure you verify these easy equalities. They follow immediately from the definitions. Now we need to define what it means to apply a polynomial to an operator. So suppose t is an operator on v, and p is a polynomial with coefficients in our scalar field f. If p of z is given by the formula shown here for each number z, then p of t is defined to be the operator that we obtain by simply replacing z with t. We also replace the constant term a0 in the polynomial with a0 times i, getting the equation shown here. For example, if p of z is equal to z cubed, then p of t is the operator t cubed. Let's look at another example. For this example, our vector space will be the vector space of polynomials with real coefficients. Let d be the differentiation operator on that vector space, meaning d of a polynomial is equal to the derivative of that polynomial. Finally, let's take a polynomial p defined by p of x is equal to 7 minus 3x plus 5x squared. According to our definition, p of d is then 7 times the identity operator minus 3d plus 5d squared. p of d is supposed to be an operator on p of r. That means if we apply p of d to a polynomial with real coefficients, we should get another polynomial with real coefficients. That's shown by the last equation here. The polynomial that we get when we apply p of d to q is 7q minus 3 times the derivative of q, plus 5 times the second derivative of q. That second derivative term, of course, comes from applying d squared to q. d is the differentiation operator, so d composed d is the operator of taking the second derivative. Now I would like to discuss some of the algebraic properties of the map that takes a polynomial p to p of t. Here is the first of those properties. Fix a linear operator t on v. Then the function from the vector space of polynomials with coefficients in f to L of v, given by a polynomial p goes to p of t, is a linear map from p of f into L of v. This result follows easily from the definitions, but make sure you take a minute to verify it yourself. Our next result is similar but it focuses on multiplicative properties. 
This result says that if T is a linear operator on V, and P and Q are polynomials with coefficients in the scalar field F, then PQ applied to T is the same as P of T times Q of T. Let's work through an example to help understand why this important result is true. Suppose P of Z is Z plus 2, and Q of Z is the polynomial Z plus 3. Then, just by using the ordinary multiplication of polynomials, we see that P times Q, evaluated at Z, is Z squared plus 5Z plus 6. We have that P of T is 2 plus Ti, Q of T is T plus 3i, and using the formula above for the polynomial PQ, we see that PQ of T is equal to T squared plus 5T plus 6 times the identity operator i. Now let's look. P of T times Q of T is T plus 2i times T plus 3i, and then multiplying that out, we get T squared plus 5T plus 6i, and then looking at the equation in the left column, the last equation, we see that that is equal to PQ of T. Thus, we have verified that P of T times Q of T is equal to PQ of T in this particular case. But this case enables you to see why it's true in general. When we multiply the polynomial P times the polynomial Q, we're just using the distributive property. And we do the same thing when we're multiplying P of T times Q of T, in this case, T plus 2i times T plus 3i, the procedure for multiplying that and finding that product, just the distributive property, same is done with the polynomial. That's the reason the PQ of T is equal to P of T times Q of T. We now have this corollary of the previous result. This corollary states that any two polynomials of T commute with each other. In general, multiplication on L of V is not commutative. Thus, it's often useful to know that in this particular case, we do have commutativity. Let's look at the easy proof for this result. We have from the previous result that P of T times Q of T is equal to the polynomial PQ applied to T. However, the usual multiplication of polynomials is commutative, so this is equal to QP applied to T. Now apply the previous result once again, this time to Q times P, concluding that QP of T is equal to Q of T times P of T. This completes the proof of this corollary. Now we come to one of the truly crucial results in linear algebra. This result states that every operator on a finite dimensional non-zero, complex vector space has an eigenvalue. Before we get to the proof, let's note that this result is false on real vector spaces. We've seen an example previously. Specifically, if T is a linear operator on R2 defined by T of X comma Y equals minus Y comma X, then T has no eigenvalues. Because this T operates on a real vector space, eigenvalues by definition, must be real. This result is also false on infinite dimensional complex vector spaces. For example, define T to be the linear operator on the vector space of polynomials with complex coefficients by defining TP of Z to be Z times P of Z. In other words, T is the operator of multiplication by Z. For example, if P is the polynomial Z squared, then T of P is a polynomial Z cubed. Because T of P has degree one larger than the degree of P, it's clear that T of P cannot be a scalar multiple of P. Thus, T has no eigenvalues. Let's get rid of these examples and move to the proof of this theorem. We want to prove that every operator on a finite dimensional, non-zero, complex vector space has an eigenvalue. Thus, let V be a complex vector space with positive dimension, and let T be an operator on this vector space V. Choose a vector V in our vector space V with V not equal to zero. Thus, we have just used our hypothesis 
that v is not the zero vector space. Now look at the list v, t of v, t squared of v, up to t to the n of v. This list has length n plus 1, and we are in a vector space of dimension n. Thus this list cannot be linearly independent. Thus some non-zero linear combination of the vectors in this list equals zero. In other words, there exist complex numbers, a0 up to an, not all zero, such that we have the top equation here in the right-hand column. Note that a1 up to an cannot all be zero, because otherwise we would be left just with the equation zero equals a0 of v, but v is not zero by choice. That would force a0 to be zero, and then if all the a1 up to an are also zero, all the a's would be zero, which is not the case here. Now make the a's the coefficient of a polynomial. In other words, consider the polynomial a0 plus a1z plus up to plus an z to the n. By the fundamental theorem of algebra, we can factor this polynomial as some constant times z minus lambda 1 up to z minus lambda m, where c is a non-zero complex number, and each of the lambda j's is in c. Let's look at this carefully. c is a non-zero number, because if c were zero, that would imply that all the a's are zero, which we know is not the case. Note, however, that it is possible that the coefficient a sub n, that's the coefficient of z to the n, is zero, thus the left-hand side might actually have degree less than n. In other words, we do not necessarily have that m is equal to n here. Notice how we were using the hypothesis that we're working in the complex numbers, because polynomials with real coefficients cannot necessarily be factored in this form using real numbers. Now we have the equation shown here in red, which is the same as the equation at the top of this column. We can rewrite that equation as follows, shown in the second line here. Finally, using the factorization above, this is equal to what is now shown in red. Look at this last equation carefully. We are applying some operator to the non-zero vector v, and we're ending up with zero on the left-hand side. This means that at some point in evaluating the right-hand side, we're applying t minus lambda j times the identity operator to a non-zero vector and getting zero. In other words, t minus lambda j i is non-injective for at least one of the j's. Thus, t has an eigenvalue, completing the proof. Before concluding this video, I would like to compare the proof we have just seen to the proof of the same theorem that is found in most linear algebra books. Most linear algebra books prove this theorem by looking at the polynomial the determinant of lambda i minus t. That polynomial is called the characteristic polynomial of t. One can prove that the determinant of lambda i minus t is equal to zero if and only if lambda is an eigenvalue of t. Then, using the fundamental theorem of algebra, every polynomial has a root, thus the characteristic polynomial has a root, thus t has an eigenvalue. That proof is mathematically correct, but it does have some problems. One needs to define the determinant first, which is a complicated object. We will eventually define the determinant in these videos, but we have no need to do so yet. Then one needs to prove that the determinant being zero is equivalent to having an eigenvalue. I think by then most of the intuition about why the result is true is gone especially because the definition of determinant is somewhat complicated. In contrast, the proof shown here uses basic notions of linear algebra that are crucial to understanding of linear algebra, mainly linear independence. This proof is perhaps the main justification for the audacious title of the book. This concludes part one of the video on eigenvectors and upper triangular matrices.